This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast, show 319. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. Hey, what's going on, everyone? This is Brandon Turner, host of the Bigger Pockets podcast, here with my co host in crime, David Green. What's up, buddy? Dude, I'm having a great day. We have an incredible interview today with just an all around solid real estate. I mean, he's not yeah. a guru, but he knows as much as one. This is a very experienced person who's kind of been through the ringer, and I can tell he knows the stuff. Yeah, he's a rock star. Nathan Brooks. He's been on the show a few times before. We'll talk about that later. But uh, today we talk about a little bit different topic. We go into what he would do differently if he started over. And we spent a lot of time on that. We also dive really deep in onto the disc profile, which if you don't know what that is, it could completely transform your business. In fact, David said earlier in the show that it completely changed everything about how he ran his business. So we talk about that. We talk about how he's finding deals. He is, he's closing 12 to 15 deals a month and he's not doing direct mail marketing. Wait till you hear what he's doing to get those deals. It's something that everybody here, whether you've never done a deal or you've done 100, you could implement in your business today. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's fantastic. So without further ado, let's get to today's quick tip. tip. All right, so today's quick tip is simple. So Lauren over in the Bigger Pockets marketing department has been hard at work negotiating a ton of excellent deals exclusively for our pro members. They include discounts on loans, property management software, direct mail marketing, and even cash back from Airbnb. So these savings are available to our pro members on top of all the other cool stuff you get as being a pro member in the landlord forums and the calculator usage and all that. So Check it out, biggerpockets.com slash perks, P-E-R-K-S, if you're a pro member. And if you're not a pro member, uh, you can go there also, and there are some regular member, like free member perks as well. So if you're just a, f- a free Bigger Pockets member, we love you too. Go check out what the kind of discounts and stuff you get access to. Again, biggerpockets.com slash perks. And now, without further delay, I want you all to hear this interview with Mr. Nathan Brooks. So let's get to that interview right now. Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Podcast, Mr. Nathan Brooks. How you doing? I am so good, Brandon. How are you? Man, I'm good, except for I almost said Mr. And then that would have been awkward. So I said Mr. <laughs> Freudian Mr. slip. He, he's the myth, right? The man, the, <laughs> the myth, myth, the legend. The myth. Nathan Brooks, can... <laughs> the only four-timer on the BP Podcast. See, I know what you were doing, Brandon. That's exactly what I was doing. Thank you for supporting me there, David. <laughs> and I'm supporting you, David, for supporting Brandon. So I think yeah. <laughs> we've got a circle yeah. of support here. Let's just do it's this the whole podcast. It's we don't like, need to talk about real estate. It's like the massage circles. You ever yeah. those? Like, <laughs> you're, you're doing great, Brandon. You're doing great. <laughs> Thanks, man. All right. Let's so Nathan has been on the show four times before, and I wrote down the numbers and then I lost them. What numbers were they? It was, this is number four, so it's 87, 159, and 232, and this will be, I'm not sure, but. All right, well, this is going to be, you're pretty much on the show like every other week. So we're going <laughs> to, there's a reason though, because Nathan and I are actually pretty good buddies. We, we talk fairly often. We text like high school girls, and we have a good time with it. So, uh, and, and Nathan, I just really, really look up to you a lot in how you built your real estate business. And so I just keep coming back to you for advice, and I'm like, why not bring the rest of the uh, BP nation into it? So that's what we're going to do today. Sound fun? Yeah, that's meaningful for you to say. And uh, it's a real, on all honesty, you know, it's a real honor to be on here for the fourth time. And, and uh, you know, it's been a, a huge part of my growing, my success, my business and everything too. So it's, it's, it's definitely mutual. And, and so I'm, I'm pumped to be on. Sweet. Well, let's go into it. So before we go into the, today's topic, which is we're, we're going to be looking back and helping new investors, like by asking you, hey, you know, what would you do differently if you could go back or what would, what do you wish you would have known when you got started? I mean, let's first of all do away with the whole, like, you know, one time I asked Seth Godin, this is a true story. Seth Godin, who's a famous author, writer, blogger, very famous guy. I, I emailed him directly because I heard that he responds to all his emails. And so this is back like seven years ago. And I said, Seth, what would you do if you could go back and do it all over again? And he responded with, if I went back, I wouldn't be the person I am today, so I wouldn't change anything, right? Mm-hmm. That's kind of like, the, and I love Seth Godin, but that's like the cliche answer. Like, of course, you, you wouldn't be who you are today. So let's just throw away that. And sure. besides that, we're going to talk about what you would do differently. Yeah. That's exactly. said, before we get there, who are you? What do you do? How'd you, how'd you get into real estate? Walk us through your story in a minute or two and uh, 
bring people up to up to speed if they didn't listen to your earlier shows? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm Nathan Brooks. I'm out of the Kansas City market. I'm a turnkey provider of a really well renovated. Uh, properties were pretty obsessed about that quality piece. And um, for years, you know, turnkeys got a bad rap because people didn't really do what, what the right thing was. So <clears throat> we'll do about 150 houses uh, out of Kansas City this year. Um, and we, I got the start back in the mid 2000s. And I rode the wave up and uh, crash and burn with the uh, wave down. And I had to rebuild my business, myself, my mind, how I wanted to do business. And so, you know, it was one of those things where I, you know, had that choice. I had that decision to make if I wanted to get back after it, after, you know, going through bankruptcy and, and having that horrible experience or, or not. And so I uh, started doing some more deals after, you know, post-bankruptcy and started uh, to do some joint venture deals. And then, you know, from there, met my business partner in 2015. And that's when I really started to understand more and more and more kind of what seat I should sit in, what I'm good at, what I'm not good at, uh, mainly from hearing from other people, right? You, when you actually start to listen and learn. And so, you know, we've grown now. And uh, so we have that turnkey company. We have a retail, a realtor um, team. This is our second year. We actually just, I just got the certificate. Uh, we had the number one listing top dog in our office for 2018, That's awesome. which is our first year of business. And our targets to do 30 million in sales uh, for our second year. And then uh, we just started a, a local meetup and uh, we've literally gone from nothing December 4th to almost 2,500 Facebook members. And we'll have 250 plus show up at our third meetup ever in KC wow. here in a week. That's incredible. All right. So on that note, let's go back and divide your story into kind of two chunks. There's okay. what I, what you would have done differently in the, the first time you got into real estate pre-bankruptcy and then <clears> what <throat> would you do different now the second time? Cause it's really like two, almost like two different stories, right? You built something, it collapsed, you built something else, mm -hmm. uh, both in real estate, right? So let's go back to the very, very beginning. You were first looking into real estate. What would you do different? You know, I definitely would have I would have gone a, just a tiny bit slower, you know, and I think there's something about people who jump in and go after opportunities, you know, and, and, and there's something important about that because there's so, I think there's a lot of people who, you know, have that analysis paralysis situation. And, and so we, we don't take the offense, but for me, it, I jumped in so fast and I literally had no idea what I was doing. So I, I, I was taken advantage of, I made some bad, bad decisions and I just didn't have any context to what was actually going on. If, if that makes sense. It does. It does. Yeah. So, so how do you balance the, I mean, it's the forever question of, uh, or, or, you know, jumping in, taking action, doing stuff or analysis paralysis, just not ever taking action. How do you balance that? And how do you recommend new investors balance that? Well, I think, you know, now that I've learned so much about like a disc profile in culture index, there's a bunch of these things out here that we can learn. So it, I think it honestly starts with learning about yourself more first. So if I would have understood more that I'm, I'm that high D, you know, disc profile person, I'm going to literally just jump in ready, fire, aim. And so if I would have recognized that about myself, then I would have recognized like, Hey, okay, we're going to jump in and that's cool, but let's make sure we understand what it actually looks like. So, you know, and really the, the, the bigger pockets of the world, you know, it's grown exponentially in the, in the learning and in teaching and all the books that are out there. Uh, so just having found, honestly, if I would have found somebody who already had been doing it and I had learned more in kind of the path of what I want it to look like, or at least somebody that I was excited about would have made all the difference in the world. So now I spend so much more time doing that you know, and now I have so much more clarity in what I want to, or what I need to learn about or uh, what I want to go after. So you mentioned something there. I think it's incredibly helpful for people and that's knowing yourself. And you mentioned the disc profile is one of the ways you do it. So I know I wrote an article on bigger pockets about the disc profile and like kind of an overview of it and how to help use it in your business. But can you explain a little of what you mean by how you how it helps you understand yourself and maybe how it helps you with the team members and putting them in the right roles. Hundred percent. And, and uh, I haven't read that article, or I, I, I'm going to go back and read it too. So disc profile is wonderful. So that the, to go just <clears throat> kind of the short answer, D is for driver uh, or like the general type. 
the one that's in the front of the room, that's probably the D. Um, I is influencer. So that's like a people person, high I, low I is not a people person. So you could be a driver and not a people person. You could be a driver and a people person. So S is stabilizing. That's like high, high S is, is, you know, takes a ton of notes and they like everything in order. Uh, low, low S me, uh, you know, that not in the details, not, not tracking all of the, uh, all of those things. And then, you know, C is that caution. And so it's, it's like being uh, high C is really, 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 you know, every I dotted, every T crossed super, you know, to the last 99% is not good enough. So once we started to understand what all those things meant, then we could say, okay, well, you know, you want somebody in a administrative situation to be a really, you know, they won't need to be personable enough, but not so high I that they're going to talk everybody and not get any work done. But you also need, you know, higher S, higher C so that they're going to actually run the play, actually have the detail to do it. And so once I started to learn that about myself, then I could say, okay, well, I'm a high D, high I, I'm terrible with details. So now I need to surround myself with people who are good at that. And, yeah. you know, one of the business coaches I have talks about the like it and love it box. And if it's not in the like it, love it box that I'm doing, so I don't like details. Why am I doing them? And so, so that was really the start of it. Brandon and I talk about how when something feels light or heavy, that's one of the ways of knowing if this fits within your skill set or not. But do you, do you want to take on that, Brandon? Sure. I mean, yeah, it's just like, ask yourself, does this feel light? And I think my, one of my coaches back in the day said that to me. Does it feel light? Like if I think about like analyzing a real estate, does that feel light? It actually does. It feels like a light activity. You know, it doesn't feel heavy. But I think about calling up a contractor to tell him to pay, you know, like to show up because he didn't show up yesterday. Oh, that's the heaviest thing in the world. It just feels like I'm carrying around a thousand pounds on my back. Right. So I've learned, yeah, it's, it's you know, I, I heard a quote from Sarah Blakely, the Spanx lady, uh, Jesse Itzler, uh, his wife. Um, yeah, I, I heard a quote from her that says, as soon as you can afford it, hire your weaknesses. And it was yeah. basically what she's saying is like, yeah, find what you're good at, what you're not good at, and hire that <clears throat> stuff out. Um, the disc profile, by the way, people can access. There's a, there's a free one online. I know to, there's probably a few. I know Tony Robbins has one. If you type in Tony Robbins disc, you'll find it in, you know, into Google. And then uh, you can take it. You can have your team take it, your, your spouse take it. It's kind of cool. It's, it's fun to kind of see. No exaggeration. That, it, it changed my life when I learned that. It seriously, it was like the Rosetta Stone that helped me understand how to communicate with people that were not me. And I realized I was carrying around so much anxiety because I knew I'm a very high D. And then C, which is kind of rare, so my brain fights with itself. But most people just did not understand the way I thought and the way I looked at stuff. And I knew when I met a new person, I didn't feel confident that I could explain what I was trying to get them to understand until I learned DISC. And then I was like, I went from feeling insecure to feeling super empowered. Like, I know how you talk to an I. I know how I talk to an S. I know how I talk to a C. And then, I mean, life just got a lot easier. It's so true. And I, I love that, you know, in, like, so a high D, high C, and not to get too nerdy in the disc, but, you know, so you're somebody who has vision and somebody who has, who likes those details. So, you know, to understand, so my business partner is a high D, high C. And because I'd always get frustrated. I'm like, as soon as I say something and I say it a couple of times, I'm like, well, why isn't it done? Right. Well, hey, guess what? If you go back and look back at my business now, some of those decisions that were made, you're like, okay, well, as soon as I say something a couple of times, I process it out loud and then I'm assuming that it, whatever it is, whatever it takes is getting done. And it's just simply not the, not the case. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense, actually. I think I'm a, so David, you're what D, you said high D, high C. I'm a yes. high I, high S. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is why Brandon and I are really good partners, right? As long as our values are aligned and we have the same goal, he, the stuff he doesn't like, like calling and talking to contractors is easy for me. That's a light activity. Like I'm going to call that guy. I'm going to light a fire under his butt. And I'm, and I, even like when we hang out, I take his phone out of his hand and I'm like, let me just talk to this guy for you. <laughs> yeah, he's done that. I do not care. Right. I'll do it. But the stuff that I don't know about doing, like putting myself out there and, and being a little bit more like gregarious and Brandon is amazing with conflict resolution and making people feel comfortable. Even the way that the podcast works out, if you think about it, Brandon does a lot of the, of the getting the guests going and getting them moving and getting them comfortable and carrying it. And I kind of hone in on specific details because that's what a DC's brain is going to do. This yeah. is so much easier because we understand that and then we can build out the system. And I really feel this is applicable to even the newbie investor <clears throat> because there's things about their, themselves that they don't understand about why investing seems so scary. If they're like, I don't want to go to a meetup and talk to people. I do not like people. 
that's not what you should be doing. Get a business partner who's like, I don't want to understand a spreadsheet ever. I just want to go tell everyone and hand out business cards and be fun. And you marry those two things together and then investing is fun. Huge. It's huge. And, and you mentioned something that I, th- I think that you can't underestimate either, which is the culture in which you have it built and those values. And once you start to understand that culture and value part, and it's not the same. So we, we think about and we see these core values and, and we have, we've done that in our business, but you know, it's, it, those values are, are indicative of the leader in that organization. Mm. And so they help, they're the guiding principle to, to the way that that business runs. And the more I learned that, the more I understood that, Hey, not only is it, is it like, you know, having the right person, right. And you have, so you understand the disc and you put them in the right seat. That's the Jim Collins, right. The, in the right seat on the, on the right bus with the right leader going the right direction, but then culturally, right. And you start to realize that those things attract and, and reject each other. And if the culture if it's right, you are going to have those people attracted to what you have going on in the first place. Yeah, I a hundred percent agree. And I love that analogy of the, the get them on the bus. I use that phrase a lot. Yeah, but you when do. you find really talented people, get them on the bus, get them in the business, find out where to put them, you know, find the seat for them. And if you have to move them around a little bit, you can, that comes from uh, good to great, right? Jim Collins. Good, good to great. great. Yeah, exactly. And, and the, the most terrifying thing about this in any person in any level of wherever you are in your business is that the direction is your responsibility. And so even if you've never done a deal before now, if you start thinking about, okay, well, these are my strengths and these are the things that I could do a really good job on. And then I can help you know, understand who I need to put around me. And it might not be even having people on your team or on your staff, so to speak, but you still need to have, you know, an attorney and a, and a title agent and, you know, whether a real estate agent, whatever it is, uh, contractors. And so now you start to understand what type of personality they are and the way that that you communicate with them and, and all the more clear, all the more, you know, those expectations come out the way that you want them to be. Yeah, that's fantastic. So uh, before we move on to the kind of the next topic, I want to get back to, you know, what you would do differently, but obviously like understanding yourself better, understanding the people around you is huge. Uh, and of course, if, if people want to read that article by David, it's called how to use the disc profile to communicate effectively in business. And you can find it at the show notes of this page uh, of the show, biggerpockets.com slash show 319. We'll put a link to it there. Uh, all right. So let's talk about the you know, pre-crash. So before, before the crash, what would you have done differently in terms of like mechanics in your business, like leverage or risk taking exit plans, things like that? I definitely would have had clear. I, I just, I literally didn't understand how to fundamentally buy, operate and sell or hold a deal. So I literally did not understand that. So I would, I would definitely have better fundamentals on what the actual data looks like. So that's one. Number two is I would have also had a clear process in which I started and ran the construction portion of the job. So just a simple, like, here's what the expectation, this is what it looks like when it's done. By the way, that's a great question for any conversation. You know, if there's some idea that's coming about, okay, cool. Well, this is all really awesome. What does it look like when it's done? That's of course the high D in me who asked that question. Yeah. Uh, And then, you know, finally, I think that it was about understanding my end goal and the clear that I've been on my why and, and how I actually am you know, what the goals are long-term, then the more clear those, those things, you know, you, you think about that analogy of like a mile and how many steps are there in a mile and each step gets you closer to the end game. So it's a huge long journey, but all of a sudden you're at the end and you're like, Oh wow, you know, here we are. Well, if the more clear I was on what that ending looked like, uh, or what the target was, then I would have, I would have made a lot more concise, better, faster, um, more clear decisions. Can you tell us what went wrong? I know, I know people can go back and listen to the first time you were on the show. We talked a lot about it in uh, show number 87, but what went wrong that first time? Like if you had to boil it down to a few mistakes that people can avoid today, what would you tell it, them? It was definitely a kind of a, a confluence of multiple things. So it was hiring a contractor who was quote unquote a business partner, um, working with a bank that I didn't really understand, didn't really understand the terms, didn't really understand how, how it worked. Uh, and then I had some bad luck. Uh, the, the partner didn't do what he said he would do. I didn't learn from it. And I didn't also have a backup plan. So I kind of just went into panic mode. And so, you know, ultimately I, I had just a lot of different problems happen at once. And then I had no backstop. So, you know, as far as, you know, having savings more, more in the, in that reserves. Uh, so there just wasn't that, that ability to, um, ride it down a little bit. 
And so I tell you what, now, you know, I don't go into these deals without understanding what my timelines are and how much money, you know, what's the worst case scenario. And uh, there's a, there's a great book in uh, money mastering the game. Uh, I can't remember who they're interviewing, but uh, Tony Robbins asks like, what's the number one thing that's important. And all these guys talk about, it's not actually making money. It's first not losing money. And so I'm, always looking at that downside. I'm always looking at what is the worst case. I'm always thinking about not just A, exit strategy, but B and C and what actually eyes wide open are the possibilities in this deal. Yeah, that's smart because I mean, things do go wrong constantly. So we always encourage people around bigger pockets, right? Is, is have that exit strategy. Look at what could go wrong. You know, oftentimes it's really easy to in real estate look at everything from best case scenario. Like when you're analyzing a deal, right? It's like, well, you know, we could probably only have $75 a month in utilities or, you know, you could probably, it's probably only going to be 5% for repairs. Like I, I caution people to yeah, think instead, like what's the worst that could happen or, or yeah. gen, maybe not the absolute worst. I mean, like you could have a meteor hit the building, right? But like generally what's like a reasonable worst case exp- uh, scenario for this deal. Run your numbers that way. See what it looks like there. Uh, and then you can run a maybe more of a, a medium, like, hey, what if it's probably okay? And then make a better decision based on that. And again, having reserves, huge. Do you have a recommendation? If somebody's jumping into real estate, going to buy their very first house, let's say they want to buy just a single family house, maybe something from like your turnkey company or whatever. How much should they have in reserves sitting in a savings account uh, to be able to buy a, call it hundred to $200,000 rental property? You know, so if we're talking to one of our turnkey clients, I will say, you know, let's say the mortgage is, 600 bucks or something like that. You know, I like to have six months reserves. I just, yeah. I like the safety of it. You know, so was that 30, 3,500 bucks, something like that. It was yep. a few thousand dollars. Uh, you know, I, people, you know, <laughs> I remember this so clearly. So I remember buying a couple homes pre pre foreclosure where I didn't do the inspection because I couldn't afford it. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> yeah, you're like, can you think of that. a dumber a dumber response than I can't afford the inspection. So I don't know better, right? Yep. I don't know what I'm buying. I don't know what I'm looking for. I've not done hundreds of deals. Now I can walk it, you know, with 95% accuracy or whatever it is. And I cannot afford the inspect. It's just so dumb. So, you're, uh, you're smoking that hopium. Just hoping <laughs> yeah. that that thing works out. <laughs> yeah. I was just, woo, it's just wild with that hopium, man. It was, it was uh, well, let me tell you, it doesn't work very well when you, you know, sometimes you get lucky, but sometimes you don't. You can say the same thing about like, I'm, I'm going to, you know, start a partnership with this guy or girl, or I'm going to raise money from this group, but I don't have enough money for an attorney to at least look over our partnership agreement. Then, yeah. you know, you really should think twice if you don't have enough money for an attorney to look over your partnership, should you have a partnership at that point? At least like a, a legal one at that point. It's a different way of looking at it. I was just telling someone this yesterday that anytime you catch yourself thinking thoughts like, oh, I don't feel good about this. I hope it works out. You should just stop. Like stop right where you are. Do not take another step and say, instead of saying, I hope this works out, what do I need to know in order to know that it will work out or at least know what could go wrong, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where the skills of being an investor actually come into play. Like, I don't know what my repairs are going to be. How do I find that out? And don't take action until you or someone around you that you trust can get that, right? Like, your anxiety is there for a reason. Your fear is there for a reason. It doesn't need to be your excuse to not take action. It needs to be like a warning sign that, hey, you need to figure this piece of it out. And like education, knowledge, understanding what you're doing. Now, I bet, Nathan, when you buy a deal, you don't feel much anxiety at all. I mean, I don't think we've asked you, how many deals is your company doing a month right now? We're doing 12 to 15, we're buying and selling 12 to 15 houses a month. Right. So that's like massive success. You guys are, you guys are kicking butt and you don't feel like, I hope this works out. Now there's going to be elements of your business where you may get a little bit of that, but then you're like, okay, I see what went wrong and you're going to readjust it there. Can you tell us how are you finding 12 to 15 deals a month in today's market? You know, we really focused, and I think I've probably talked about this before, but really on the relationships, because ultimately, if people know that we can can execute and and we actually close, then, you know, well, A, a it's that. So we, we've, people now know that we'll actually close. And number two is that we, we have the economies of scale to actually come at something like that. So we have multiple people looking at deals all the time. And then we built out a proprietary system. So literally in 60 seconds, I can plug in numbers in the back end of my system. It pops out three, three numbers 
which are, mm -hmm. you know, the LTV of the deal loan, loan to value. So my all in cost to the value, um, my return on capital. So what am I going to actually make with my money invested? And then the third one, which I think that we don't talk about enough is the, the return to the, the cost of construction. And we found when we would look back and see the ones that we got our butts kicked on, we would, we would have been really high. So let's say it was a $200,000 ARV. We get this smoking deal. That's 30 grand for the house or something, but you have a hundred thousand dollar budget. Mm. So, so now all of a sudden you take, okay, well the scaling and the opportunity of having something go sideways, that's a $30,000 budget compared to a hundred thousand dollar budget. It's totally different. Yeah. So, you know, it, that's a massive, massive difference. So we, we can really, we can, we can quickly get on something. We pay cash, we can close it in a couple of days or a week or a month or whatever that that, that person wants. So, well, I think you recognize that the construction is the riskier part of the deal because more things can go wrong than just the price you pay for the house. Like you have a really good idea what an asset's worth. So you can mess up in small ways, but there's less variables. But the construction, there's so many things that can go wrong, right? So when the deal starts to get heavier on the construction side than the actual price you paid, there's more opportunity for risk. And that's just so beautifully said. Like what you did was you recognize, here's the part where I could really get hurt. Let me avoid this rather than focusing on the things that, aren't going to get you hurt as much. Like, should I do this in an LLC or in my own name? And that's where a lot of people get stuck. Right. Well, and you know, I think one, one point before this conversation, we were talking about what to say no and our feeling, you know, how our feelings are. And, and the other cool part about having those metrics really clear is that it's faster to yes, but it's also faster to no. And, and people, I think a lot of times are afraid of no, and we need to be trained that no is okay. We just have to know why we're saying no. So that, I think that's a, a massive, massive opportunity. And then, you know, people who are buying homes for us then, then can say, okay, well, I know this is a no. I can see the data right here. And now I'm going to move on to the next one rather than sending out my guys to go look at it or, you know, put in the contracts and all that stuff together that, that takes that, that most important thing, which is that human time capital to go do it. Yeah, that's, that's really good. Hey, I, I'm wondering, so when we talk about relationships with finding deals, uh, a couple questions on it. First of all, are, are, are those typically wholesalers that are wholesaling deals to you? Are you guys also doing direct mail marketing? Are you doing anything else like specifically on your lead gen? So we don't do really any direct mail marketing. Uh, we buy off MLS still. We okay. build relationships uh, in our meetup. So we, we're, we're definitely getting deals uh, out of that meetup and yep. an opportunity you know, to talk to people about them. And we're also looking ways to help those new wholesalers too. So like, Hey, let us help you understand how to comp stuff better. Let's, uh, let's help you understand how to price them better for you. So then, you know, we can buy them and you know how to buy for us. Yeah. And the other thing is having the clear buy box. So we talk about this a lot. And when we explain so that people, they already come to us and they're like, Hey, this looks like a, a bridge deal, right? So they already know, like, this looks like this is something you guys would buy. They, and so the better we do at explaining what we buy and how we buy it and the numbers that we need to buy them at. So, um, you know, MLS, wholesaler relationships, and then other realtors that we, we know. And then, you know, occasionally we buy them direct, direct from um, sellers, but not very often. Okay. All right. That's great. And what I, what I like about that is that anybody can do that today listening to this. If you're a brand newbie, you can go to networking events. You can meet wholesalers. You can tell them what you're looking for. You can help them learn how to run the numbers if they don't know how, or if you don't know how, you can learn online and learn like, you know, how to run the numbers and then help them. I mean, like you're not doing anything to buy 12 to 15 deals a month that the newbie looking for his first deal can't do. Hundred percent. That, that's what I love. And, and the other thing about this, and I see this a lot, and in our meetup now, I actually coach people on this when I see people post stuff in there. So if you just say like, I want a deal, you know, or I want a partner, you know, that's not really, you're not bringing the value to attract somebody else who wants that. But instead, if you said, you know, I'm looking for a contractor that I can give my time for the next two weeks on a job that's in this area, which is where I want to work. I will come and work, you know, a couple hours a day and I'd like to learn what your process is. Yeah. You know, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. And the more that you start thinking about how you can help other people, those will naturally come back to come and help you. Very true. So let, let's move on a little bit and talk about, uh, your, so your current business model, you are, you run a turnkey business, which for those who don't know, it's, you basically buy and correct me if I'm wrong on any part of here, you buy properties, you then fix them up, you make them look and function. And, and again, you said you focus on quality, getting them really good. Then you rent them out and then sell them. Or do you sell them to out of state investors typically, or just anybody really, but usually probably out of state. 
and then you rent them out or how, and then you manage them correctly. Like how does that work? Okay. So very simply, and we use, we use the two set of eyes approach. So two set of eyes when we buy it. So on the acquisition side, and then we, we have a full, uh, you know, renovation scope in budget. So really by the time we close on them, we, we want to have all that stuff in place. So literally if we wanted to, we have a contractor assigned, I buy it on Monday. I started on Tuesday. Okay. So that's our goal. We're not always that, that tight on it, but you know, within a week or two now, we're, we're pretty much typically on that job. Uh, so we run the construction and we, we take an approach that's anything that doesn't have a 10 year useful life or more gets fixed or replaced. So this is one of those places where turnkey, you know, really got a bad rap and people would basically, you know, lipstick on the pig, yep. sell it as a turnkey home. And so we wanted to kind of go against that, make sure like, listen, not only are we giving you the scope of work to our client, but Hey, if it doesn't have a 10 year useful life or more, we fix or replace it. And then, so we go through, through that and complete the construction. Then we, we uh, bring in, you know, two people again. So we have two sets of eyes and we go through literally three steps. So our team internally looks at it and make sure, Hey, we, we create the punch list, if you will. And then we send in a third party inspector and uh, they, you know, go through it with a fine tooth comb. And then we bring in that property manager. So by the time, uh, it comes out of the factory, so to speak. We've really done a good job of double and triple checking everything that's in there. And then we send it immediately to the property management company, take professional pictures. If you are not taking professional pictures of your rental property, stop and go start doing it now. Yeah. Uh, so it's so important. It shows so much better. You'll get more rent for it. Don't even think about it. Go spend the hundred bucks or whatever it is and go have it done. Yeah, it's a great so, tip. It's vital. And then, and then lastly, we, we actually tenant that property before we sell them. So that way we know that the client, because let me tell you, we've been through some nightmare situations where we sold it at, you know, prior to, and now we can literally say, listen, Brandon, David, you're buying a turnkey from us. Uh, don't sweat it. We're going to have the tenant placed. So by the time you close on it, it as it, it is truly a turnkey property and it truly is cash flow day one. Yeah. That's fantastic. So let's, let's talk about uh, mistakes that people make, like newbies, especially when they're buying turnkey, when they're buying from somebody who essentially what you're doing, I mean, for those who still maybe not don't quite grasp it, you're basically flipping houses, but instead of listing them on the market, you're selling them to your private list of investors, like people who yep. are interested in buying out of state or again, you probably have some that are in state, but usually it's like, uh, I notice a lot of people from California or New York or, you know, Hawaii yep. that so. Do that. The, and, and I want to actually give you a specific example too. So we've, we've started working with this, uh, this company called ADPI, Active Duty Passive Income. And these guys help military guys specifically um, invest in real estate. So as opposed to going and blowing money on the brand new F-150 or the brand new Mustang, you know, so I'm personally really passionate about this because, you know, I, I'm always the guy who goes in the airport and is like, Hey, I see somebody in, in uniform or whatever. I'm like, Hey, thank you for your service. So now, you know, when we get somebody like that, we, we get to explain the basic real estate education. Right. And so we know that, Hey, you, you are not, you don't have to be an expert in Kansas city real estate. You have to know that this is what your goal is. So you want to invest in real estate. You want to get your spouse home from work. You want to, you know, you're an active duty service member and you just want to take that money and invest it in something that's going to come back. So almost all of our clients are out of state and, you know, we, we always tell them, like, listen, we want to build this so that you don't have to sweat it. You don't have to worry about it. You just need to understand like what kind of returns you're looking for and that long term, you know, this is a long term play. So for people who hear this and they're trying to figure out, is this right for them? Should I go turnkey? Should I do it myself? What are some ways people can know what the best option for them would be? Such a great question. So says the high C. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, turnkey is not for everybody, 100%. So turnkey is for, for the person who, you know, we have firefighters, we have military personnel, we have, you know, tech entrepreneurs, attorneys, you know, on and on and on. So those are the, the people who are professionals, they love what they do, they, you know, they have money to invest and they want to have something else besides that stocks and bonds investment. Mm. And by the way, now is an incredible time to be investing in real estate too. If you look at the tax benefits 
and all of the things that are, you know, p- p- politics aside, the current administration that we have benefits as real estate investors. And, and if you haven't looked at that and you are thinking about investing now is definitely the time. So, um, Turnkey is not for somebody who maybe you're real handy, you know, and you, you want to go in and, and do the, some of the stuff yourself and you could do that burst strategy, the, the buy rehab, uh, rent refinance and repeat, which is wonderful. And that's how I started in, in real estate. Um, if you are somebody who you like to build systems and build teams and, and we know people who have teams, I know really successful businesses who have teams in other states, but you have to be very process driven. You have to understand how to build that team and, uh, and be able to invest in it. So I think turnkey is great for somebody who doesn't want to swing the hammer, doesn't want to fix the toilet, you know, doesn't want to have the headaches of running the construction, knowing how to buy it, knowing how to rehab it, knowing how to, you know, price it. And then, you know, buying them, you know, birth strategy or whatever is for somebody who wants to be a little bit more in depth and, um, you know, go through those lessons and also, you know, reap the reward of having, you know, some equity or whatever in those deals. I have an analogy that buying turnkey is like going to Seven Eleven and getting a Coke out of the the free the fridge. Like it's just right there, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I forgot to grab it at home. I don't have time to go to Costco and buy it and load it up and fight traffic and get it home and put it in my fridge and wait mm-hmm. for it to get cold and then remember to take it. That's kind of like what my method is, is I want to go find those houses and do all that work. But yes. if you're someone who's doing really well and you just know I'm not going to do anything turnkey could be a really good option for you because someone else has already done the work. They've taken care of the part of the funnel that's the, the hardest. Exactly. And the other thing about it, I think that is nice. And obviously I sell turnkey, so it seems a little self-fulfilling, but um, you know, it, that if you're in a market that is really tough to have cash flow properties this way, even at the number of paying, you know, retail price, you still get a really nice cash flowing asset and you get a, a really stable market in, you know, like Kansas city or some of the other, you know, Midwestern, um, cash flow markets that are that are just really good, stable, great long term uh, investment plays. Yeah. So let's say that I want to build a turnkey company just like yours, and I want to do twelve to fifteen deals a month, and I'm getting excited hearing all this. What are things that people need to know? Like the most important thing they got to do to get started. And if you look at your whole career, what are the what's the thing maybe that you would have done differently, or maybe just that you realize when I figured out this piece, everything else fell into place. The most important part. You know, when I started to understand myself better uh, and what I was good at and the more clear objectively I was about it and I stopped doing the other stuff, the far better my business went. And we went through um, EOS implementation. So there's a book called Traction. And so we started to learn about like, okay, what are what organizationally, what does the company look like and what seats should sit in where and then who should do what tasks. And by the way, this is stuff I hate doing. So I don't like the detail. I don't like getting in to try to understand all those tasks, but let me tell you what it is a game changer. And once we finally started to be able to say, this is what I, my job is, Nathan, I am, I am the, 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 person who creates culture. I'm the person who has the sets the vision and helps explain what's happening as a company. I'm, I'm responsible to help lead and show the team from the front what I should do. And so if you really want to build a team, uh, you are only as good as you are. That's the terrifying and wonderful thing. Your, your business is only as good as you are. So you have to start today with learning not only what is your core focus as your company, um, you want to do 12 to 15 deals. Awesome. What does the infrastructure look like, you know, today doing one deal a month or two deals a month. So, you know, administratively construction management, uh, how am I buying and selling deals? How am I financing them? And then what does it look like at scale? And then back to that question I asked earlier, right? What does it look like when it's built? So I have 11 full-time staff people on my team and we have three people sitting in, uh, in, in leadership seats and, you know, now you can start to back it up and say, okay, well, there are actually people out there who are doing that. This is what their business looks like. And then you go start asking questions right now with those people in your market or on bigger pockets or whatever it is, go take them to lunch, harass them 52 times and start asking the questions of, okay, this is what I want it to look like. Now what? 
okay, cool. I learned that. Now what? And just start building out that pathway to understand what it actually looks like and then keep coming back to that 10,000 foot view. You know, you come out to the 10,000 foot view and then come back down to the today and then come back out to that 10,000 foot view. And then you start to actually assimilate the information and build that you know, bridge, (laughs) the bridge from where you are to where you want to go. All right. So, I mean, that, that's really, really good. So what about the brand newbie? Should they do the same thing? Should they sit down and mock up what their business looks like at the end? And then how should they treat, I mean, should they, like, if you were to go back and do that over again, let's say the second half, you build your turnkey company, the second half here um, Mm -hmm. of your, of your, your story, should you have sat down and taken on a piece of paper and said, there will be a CEO, there will be a VP of this, a VP of this, a VP or whatever, you know, your structure looks like, or is, or is there another way of looking at that? It's a great question. Um, I think that it's important to do that, even though it's probably going to be wrong. And I think a lot of times we're afraid to write it out. So I, I have a journal and it's in my bag back here. And so I journal all the time about what the next quarter looks like. And then, you know, we have five year targets as a company. And so I don't want, I think people are afraid to write it down and then it doesn't happen or write it down and you have to make a change, but without having the actual vision of what you want, then how are you possibly going to put things in motion that, that are actually going to get you there? You just can't, right? It's, it's just like shooting. You're you're asking, you're, you're shooting at a target, but there's no target. Yeah. Right? So you're just shooting down range, but there's nothing to aim at. So how do you know if you're on target or not? I think it was so, uh, Eisenhower, I think, said like plans are worthless. Planning is everything. Yeah. Like, you know, your plans might not work out, but who cares? Planning is what gets you there. You have to plan. And, and it, it, there's something else like, you know, pl- plan to fail or fail to plan or something like that. You know, it's yeah. the same, same deal where, go ahead, David. Failing to plan is planning to fail. There you go. I had many drill instructors and coaches screaming that at me (laughs) over my career. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And so I think, and and that's the beautiful thing. So if you're a newbie and you're like, okay, I really want to just flip my first home. Okay. Well, that is the mission, right? Great. Where are you going to buy it? What price point? How are you going to fund it? Do you have a partner? If so, what is their responsibility? If not, okay, what is it that needs to happen next? How do I know, you know, uh, when it closes, what do I do? Do I have insurance on it? You know, okay, cool. When I meet with the contractor, do I have a clear scope of work? Do I know how to explain to them what I want it to look like? If I'm putting it on MLS, bring your realtor in. Say, okay, this realtor's done a bajillion deals in this neighborhood. They know it well. This is what we need it to look like. So just because you have some ARV of some number doesn't mean that you're going to produce that house if you don't put the intent behind it. So, you know, we can pull it all the way back down just to have one single house as a focus and you can still apply that same concept and working through it, you know, from start to the end goal. So going to your personal story again a little bit, uh, you know, obviously you're flipping these houses to sell to, to investors, which is a fantastic model. What about your personal? I mean, are you still buying rentals yourself? Are you still doing any of that work? Uh, and what does that look like? And uh, yeah, we'll start there. Yeah, I'm still buying rentals myself. I still buy in the same areas. Um, you know, I have a personal goal of, you know, having $100,000 a month in, in passive rental income. That's what I, I'd like that to look like ultimately. And so, you know, I'm buying personally. I have several dozen rentals. I am, you know, our company, uh, we're looking at some c- senior living stuff. So I'm really excited into 2020 to look at some of the senior living. And uh, there's going to be a huge need for people. And, you know, all of this comes you know, one of my big goals personally is to be able to give away a million dollars a year before I'm dead and to have it in perpetuity. And it goes to health, education, and, and arts. And so I know if I have this big fat goal at the end that all those things in the middle, I'm just going to be pursuing uh, life and a business that produces this and that then, and, you know, we're able to give back. So what's the point of, you know, building this giant business and having all of this, um, you know, stuff if you can't actually do something cool with it. So that's absolutely as motivating as, you know, making the money now. Yeah. Really, really good perspective there. So let's, let's shift gears here a little bit and get dive a little bit deeper into your real estate business through our deal deep dive. (laughs) 
All right, let's get to the deal deep dive. This is the part of the show where we dive deep into one particular deal that you've recently done or something in your story that we can really spend some time, uh, you know, going over the, a number of questions about that property. So, uh, without further ado, let's just dive into it. Do you have a property in mind? I definitely do. All right. What kind of, we'll start with this question. What kind of property is it? And then me and David will just go back and forth. Well, it originally started as a turnkey property. All right. Originally started. All right. Okay. Yes. How did you find this mysterious property? So we bought it uh, from a wholesaler and uh, we had a, we, get, we had a pretty, pretty incredible deal. Uh, when okay. we, when we looked at it from the front end, how much, how much was that deal? It was about a hundred thousand. All right. So you got under contract for a hundred thousand or is that the asking? Yeah. Yeah. It was under contract for about a hundred thousand. Right. Okay. And how did you negotiate that price of a hundred thousand? Um, we, we have gotten pretty good at knowing how to, you know, know our numbers. So we, we pretty aggressively negotiate and, and kind of explain the, the values and explain the construction. And so, you know, working through that. And, um, so if I remember correctly, it was, it was one that was pretty easy under contract and, uh, through that whole process, we were able to get, you know, pretty much what we had asked for. Okay. All right. Let's go with, uh, funding it. How do you fund, how do you fund this one? And then I'm also curious, how do you fund all your other deals? But let's start with how do you fund so this one? We fund this one uh, with uh, with private money, so we've raised uh, about six and a half million dollars in in private funds, and so we help you know buy and sell uh, all our deals through that. Um, so yeah, it was it was very simple on the on the funding side of that, and uh, you know lots of times people use like their IRA money or um, you know something like that retirement funds so that they can get a great return, and and then we are able to uh, you know, use it for the for the buy and and renovation. Okay, what did you do with it once you had it? So we began uh, in earnest with the construction. So, um, and I, I remember now that there was actually like a foot and a half of water in the basement when we bought it and uh, because it was a foreclosure. And so literally you could have gotten, it's a big house. I think it's around 2000 square feet. You could have literally gotten in a canoe and canoed through the basement of this house. Um, so I'm not even kidding. <laughs> Uh, so we, we get, get, you know, get the property, uh, we get multiple pumps down there, those, you know, water pumps or whatever, and get everything out. No big deal. Uh, it's not the first time we'd had, you know, issues with water. And uh, so we have, you have, the, you know, full construction budget and plan and, and, uh, scope work and everything. So we, you know, we begin, uh, running through the, uh, the whole, the whole rehab. Okay. So what was the outcome? Like what, what happened? I, I sent the story coming. So uh, we get most of the way through construction and uh, we're almost done, right? We have the house pre-sold now uh, for, I think it was 200,000. And, and we, had a pretty, we had a really nice margin in the deal. I, I don't remember exactly the construction. I want to say it was about 40,000. And uh, so <laughs> come to find out, we're, we're literally like a week or two from, um, from, from selling it, from closing on it. And we're about to send it to property management because uh, we, we were sold at turnkey and come to find out the house is in a flood zone. Oh, so, uh, all of a sudden the interest insurance rate, right. Yep. goes from mm. whatever it would be to double or triple or quadruple. So it blows out his cash flow numbers yep. and he's like, I'm sorry guys, I can't, you know, I can't buy it. So we're like, ah, and it was been like, you know, three times the insurance uh, rate of that. And so it was just a complete nightmare. So we go out of contract, we give his, his earnest money back. And so we have to start figuring out what we're going to do. So we decide, okay, you know what, we're just going to put on MLS, somebody, you know, it's a really cool area and somebody will like to, to live here. And so we, we put on MLS. So, you know, everything else had been working fine in the house. Uh, we, we put it on. So we, we have a buyer puts it under contract and uh does their inspection so you know most of the things in the inspection just fine uh but this one little tiny thing that it is not on city sewer it's not on septic it's mm. actually on holding tanks what did what did that, that even mean pretty sure, like some guy had a idea that a crate of gallon jugs and then, you know, like <laughs> puts it under the ground or something. I don't know. It's, it's not good. Not oh. good. 
So come to find out this, you know, really great deal that we bought and we ran to construction and we had all this stuff and then we put on MLS uh, or sold it turnkey, not turnkey, now a flood zone. And now come to find out that it is not connected to city sewer and it is 300 feet to the nearest connection. <laughs> Ooh. That sounds are, cheap. Uh, and across the neighbor's backyard. No, oh, even better. Yeah. So we have to get agreement from the neighbor and then we have to, you know, run 300 feet of this, you know, sewer line and then have the city connection, of course, which is not cheap either. And so, <laughs> you know, 20 some thousand dollars later and, uh, you know, another bribe to the neighbor to, you know, send one of our staff over and, and make sure that, you know, uh, talk really kindly and nicely and get them to, you know, agree to it. And so we finally, finally, finally get this thing a soul. We get the, the right buyer and go through the inspections. And so instead of making, you know, 40 or $50,000 on the flip, we, I'm pretty sure we lost like five or $10,000 in the deal. So, um, and it was one of those, we're just so happy to have it gone. Gone. Yep. Yeah. So it was definitely a, a crazy one. So what so, did you learn? What lessons did you learn from this one? I tell you what, we learned a lot of lessons in this one. You know, we, we learned from the scoping standpoint, you know, what do we look at? And if there's any, any question, you know, checking those sewer lines and checking the, you know, we don't scope every single property, but we definitely just double check. Uh, you know, is it, you know, all the neighbor, that, this is what was strange about this is all the neighbors were on sewer, but this one was not. And, um, and then we also learned that, Hey, we, we need to stay in our lane and it's taken us a lot of different times to learn this, but like stay in your lane. If we're a turnkey company and we do a really great job delivering great turnkey properties, but we're not, we're not a high end, you know, flipper. That's not what we do. We got lots of buddies who are great at it, but as soon as you start to, you know, veer off and, and get outside of the thing that you've really practiced and not to say that we couldn't do that, right? If we put the time and focus on that, we could, we could solve that. But you know, the passion and the direction of our company, we spent a lot of time in the turnkey. And so, you know, we had to really get back to that and make sure we were buying the things that we knew well, we knew how to operate well, and we could execute well. Yeah, such good advice in there for anybody, right? I mean, like stay in your lane as much as possible. Like, you know, it's easy to get shiny object syndrome and start looking around for other things because it's fun. But that's usually when you end up screwing up. So thank you for sharing that. And I love, I love deep dives where things don't work out necessarily awesome because like it teaches mm -hmm. like even the pros, we, we screw up. It happens, right? So it does. Anyway. It does. And, and it's okay. It's a lesson, right? We, we need yep. to use it as a tool that we learn from and not be ashamed of it, not be afraid of it. There you go. And, um, so, yeah. All right. Well, let's, let's shift gears here and head over to the next segment of the show. This is the fire, fire round. round. It's time for the fire round. All right, let's get to the fire round. These are the questions that come direct out of the bigger pockets forums. We're going to fire them at you in a nice, uh, quick manner here. Number one, Gilbert from West Palm beach, Florida, after mustering, the courage and getting out there, researching, analyzing. I've been making offers, but I feel like I'm behind on negotiation. Any tips on negotiating with sellers in a competitive market? Absolutely. There's a great book out there called Never Split the Difference. Mm, yep. And it talks about like how you formulate questions and how you're talking to people. And so I think the more we understand what problem, not that we're solving for ourselves, but what we're solving for that seller. And if you really focus on the pain, you really focus on the problem and you get to the root of it and that you're on their side and it doesn't feel like there's this butting up against each other, but rather working together, then you'll find a lot more success. Perfect. Perfect. And of course we interviewed uh, Chris Voss on show 260 of the bigger pockets podcast. You can listen if you want by going to biggerpockets.com slash show 260. All right. Next question. Hey, Oh, actually, no, sorry. This is yours, David. I well, Chris know. Voss was the author of never split the difference. The book. Yes. I don't was know. Mentioned I don't there. Yeah. Really good book. I've even so used Chris Voss and listened to him talk quite a bit. He, uh, he has some really good stuff. All right. Next question. I'm curious if anyone out there can chime in on what specific projects within a rehab produce the best return on investment, not big things like roof or HVAC. I'm talking about smaller finishes like granite countertops, flooring, vanities, et cetera. You know, I'm actually going to take it a little different route. And I was in a mastermind all weekend and we were talking about staging 
in, especially on staging a home or like earlier, we talked about the rental properties and taking professional photography, but you know, in the day and age now, it has to look right. It has to feel right. And so I think most people, you know, even when you look at granite, there's, there's so many types of, you know, countertops and stuff like that, that look really nice. So we, we really focus on, you know, staging the home and taking really great photography or like there's a thing called a Matterport camera where you can walk through the whole, you know, the whole property. So, you know, I would really think about the, the experience. So first of all, who are, who is this product for, right? So is it a tenant? Is it a buyer? Is it a high end buyer? Whatever. How does it feel when we walk in and it's our, it's a home for them. And then how are we, how are we delivering that experience to them in a way that's really good, really well explained, visualized, whatever, uh, through that. Do you do any work staging for tenants at all? You know, we, uh, don't really do much staging on the tenant side. We do still do some retail flips and we stage every single one of them because okay. the photography just looks way better. Yeah, um, on the, you know, that's an interesting question though, is if you did a little bit of staging, like just like the, you know, t towels and a few pictures and stuff like that, yeah. it's, it's pretty interesting. It, uh, we might have to test that. Well, yeah. In, in, when we first got into real estate, it wasn't as easy to rent out a unit as it is today. I mean, today in my market, like, you know, you just put up a Craigslist ad, you got 20 people calling, but back when I got started, it was not like that. So we actually used to do that a little bit. We'd stage the bathroom a little bit. I mean, we wouldn't haul in couches and beds or anything like that, but we would do a little bit. We'd put up curtains sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, just little things like that. I, it helped us at the time. Yeah. Today we don't do it cause we don't need to, but when the need arises, how do we get better than other people? It's like, yeah, well, that's how I'm going to do it. Absolutely. And you can do other little stuff like, you know, something that smells nice in the plugins in the home, yeah. you know, and you can also just the pictures make such a difference when you, it's, when it's like, I cannot stress enough. Agents will come and tell people, Hey, I'm going to market your house better than anyone else. Right? Like there's this super secret list of, of buyers that no one knows about. And that right. is not the way it works anymore. Like everything is out there for everyone to see you don't go to a super secret squirrel group of people. You just make your stand out from everyone else. And when tenants are just being bombarded by all their options and then yours look the best, they're just going to zoom in on that and go see it right away. And, and good photographers do it. The other thing that's tricky about that question, and I love how you answered it, is people want to like get a direct answer. If I put in the, the vanity, how much more will the house sell for? Mm -hmm. But buyers don't make decisions like that. They're not a computer that runs through an algorithm and says, oh, you use this tile shower instead of that shower stall, I will pay $743 more. It's the feel that it gives them. They make decisions based on their emotions. And so if you spend a lot of money to fix your house up and you then don't change your kitchen cabinets that are just ugly and they stand out, it doesn't matter what you spend on everything else. People just don't like it. Or if it smells bad, man, that's such a good tip you gave Nathan. Like the pictures are great, but the minute they walk in, it smells like a wet dog. Good luck. You're not going to sell it, right? And it's no. just kind of helping people understand that shift away from you can't turn this into uh, if I do X, I'll get Y. It's more how do I get the finished product for as cheap as I, I can because that's what the buyer cares about. So yeah, the more experienced that you are, the more you start to realize that becomes a case. Uh, Brandon, you want to take the next question? Sure. Uh, Josh from Atlanta, I've been running into a lot of shady wholesalers. They're doing things like marking up properties 200% and then marketing those deals that they don't even have under contract. Is that normal? How do I tell if the wholesaler I'm dealing with is legit? We have had some similar experiences, which drives me crazy, by the way. Um, there, you can have a contract and you can assign a contract that's been assigned. So that is legal if you actually have it under contract. But or at least it is in my market. I don't, I don't want to speak for anybody else. I'm not an attorney. I'm not giving uh, legal advice. Thank However, you. yes, um, the, here's, here's what you need to do is you need to say, cool, 123 Main Street looks great. Um, are you the seller? or do you have this under contract and are you assigning it? Okay, great. Would you please send me the assignment contract along with the sales contract? Mm. And it's, that's as simple as it is. And then you know if they actually legitimately have someone, a, a property that they can sell or not. And then, you know, we just, we stopped doing business or even looking at emails, you know, getting off the email lists of people we know who just send out blasts of stuff. Uh, you know, just ask them and ask around too, because the, the communities are small, you know, it, it, it real estate, uh, you know, there's a lot of people out doing this business, but when you get really down into the market, market specific, people know. So, you know, if, you, if you're not sure, um, you know, ask around and then ultimately it's all about that contract because it's not going to close without it. So you might as well ask for it now. 
Yeah, wholesaler is a bit of a misleading title because there really is no way of defining. Like, it's not like if you say you're an agent and you can produce a license that shows you went through a process. You know, um, a lot of wholesalers are people without an agent license and don't have a house under contract. They have like nothing, and they're half pretending to sell it like a real estate agent, and then they're calling themselves a wholesaler to do it. And you have zero protection when dealing with someone like that. So it is a little scary. Hundred yeah. percent. Okay, last question. Uh, when it comes to vetting property management companies, I was listening to show 124 with Jared Sturm and he talked about reaching out to local property managers in the role of a renter rather than as an investor with a portfolio, which I thought was pretty clever. I'm curious if anyone else can share strategies for assessing property management companies. You know, you know, in our business, we, we obviously property management is a huge component of, of turnkey and in, you know, any investment that any person is holding is it's actually not about you. It's not about the property. It's actually about the tenant because nothing else happens if you don't have the tenant paying your, your, your rent, right? Because then all the other things and benefits we talk about don't matter. So with that said, I still think it's important to approach it from the owner's perspective. And so you want to ask about like, what, what is it like? Uh, how do you manage? What is your philosophy? What is the culture of your company? How many staff do you have? What do you do when it's time to market a property? What sets you apart? What's your process for that? Uh, tell me about how you, how you actually turn the property. So when the tenant's moving out, what is the timeline like to go from the date, date that they moved out? You know, how do you uh, notify me about make ready, you know, how, how do you charge? Do you have in-house maintenance? Do you have uh, maintenance that's not? And then also like understanding what are the, what are the fundamental costs of it? So like, what's the monthly management? What is it? What do you charge to place a tenant? Uh, and then do you mark up maintenance or do you have that in-house out? You know, so there's, I would start understanding and then talking to a couple other investors who work with them. And then you, and then also how do I access my information? Right? So do I have a portal? Do I get a monthly email? You know, so like my property manager would they email me my information and, and my, you know, the individual itemized, you know, properties so I can understand and see clearly and quickly what it is that, you know, that month looked like. So, and then here's the last one, which is, I think, even the most important. So we always talk about like what the, when it's good, it's easy, but what happens if there's a problem? And so, you know, I would ask my property manager, if you're interviewing somebody say, Hey, there's a thousand dollar sewer problem. What are you going to tell? You know, how, how is that going to be handled? When you call me, what, what do you tell me? And then how, what is the process like? And what is the expectation of me and how fast do we address it and get on the problem? Because ultimately if you're taking care of the tenant, the tenant will be happy. The tenant will be paying. And it's all about that communication that comes back and forth between that property manager. There you go. All right. Well, that was the end of the fire round. Now it's time to get over to the world famous. Famous four. And now let's get to these four questions that we've asked you three times before. This is the fourth yeah. <laughs> famous four we've ever followed through on. Number one, <laughs> what's your favorite real estate related piece of literature? <laughs> book. You know, um, I am going to go with a uh, book that has changed me on my business trajectory and thinking, but it is not technically a business book. And it's called The Shortness on the Shortness of Life by Seneca. And it really has helped me think about the direction and vision of my business, of my person, you know, of, of who I am as a person, and really thinking about that and applying it to my whole business and it's a beautiful little book. I just got introduced to it. Um, and, uh, so yeah, I, I love the book. All right. What is your favorite business book? My favorite business book? Uh, I would say that I am currently most fired up about extreme ownership, which I uh, may or may not have talked about before, but it is, I think when I think about the level and quality of books, when there's books that are around for just a couple of years and are a fad or the be around for a hundred years, I think that book will be around and not just on business, but on leadership and on personal growth. And it's just a fundamentally fantastic book. I love that book. It's the only book I've read Brandon hasn't. And I tell him about it all I've the time. Half of it. I read half of it. I I'm going to I'm gonna text you about it every day. I know. I you just should. finish it. I just, I, it, it was so, good. It was, it was a good book. I just like, I started it and then I listened to some and then I got into something else and just, I, I need to get like a physical copy in my hand. I'll actually finish it. 
It's yeah. so good. I really want to get on Jocko's podcast and talk about that book and how it's changed my business, oh, it's changed my life. Me it's- too. I so badly want I I so badly. Um, and I, I train MMA also. And um, just he's, he's and not only is he a great, you know, writer and, and author and dichotomy of leadership was great too, by the way. But, you know, also he owns multiple businesses and mm. has a, uh, he's, he's just a, a brilliant, brilliant guy. And super humble, which is another thing that just basically like, you very impressive about that guy. Okay. Uh, other than uh, training in MMA, which you just mentioned, what are some of your other hobbies? Well, I tell you what, train, I love to train and I train, you know, four or five days a week. Typically. Um, I also recently bought a tractor. Uh, so I love, you know, I put in like a road on my property. So my wife and I, um, our home is on 11, 11 plus acres. So we actually, you know, have all kinds of space to do whatever. Nice. And, uh, so that, that's a blast and hanging out with my kids and wife and we have a Creek on the property and we can do all kinds of stuff outdoors. So anything, anything outside and, and being able to just enjoy, enjoy, uh, you know, being with the, with the kids and the, and the missus is awesome. All right. Well, what do you think sets apart successful real estate investors from those who give up, fail, or never get started? So I'm going to name another book, which is the go-giver and it's by Bob Berg. And I think the thing that actually separates people and, and I just am learning this is a willingness to give uh, and in a willingness to actually not be afraid that, um, you know, that we are so protective of everything that we have and we've worked so hard, but you know, the more that you help others and then you give that, that information or give that time or give that kindness away, it, it comes back and it, and it is real and it's palpable and it's powerful. And so the more successful the people are the more willing I, I know and see it over and over again. They're willing to help you and help others. And so, you know, to me, that's the biggest tool, the most powerful thing in uh, just having an open mind and a willingness to help. All right. Perfect. Well, if I want to buy a turnkey property or just find out more about you, Nathan, where can people find out more about you? Um, so there's a couple ways. I'm, I'm most active social media on Facebook. So you can just search Nathan Brooks. It's a cute picture of myself and my daughter wearing these pink glasses. So it's pretty nice. adorable. And uh, so that's number one. Number two is uh, bridgeturnkey.com. Uh, so bridgeturnkey.com. And you can check out the properties and talk to my team there. And then uh, if you're, you know, local in KC or you're coming through, then bridgemeetup.com is our meetup and come and come and hang out. And you two gentlemen would be welcome anytime. I'd already harassed Mr. Turner about coming out, but maybe oh, yes. now that you know that we have rented a theater, uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe I can get you to come. <laughs> it, it may happen. And I'm sure you guys will coordinate your outfits and have your little we bromance will. going on before you go. It'll 100%. Be fantastic. We'll have a beard check in. Uh, so. <laughs> We're pretty much identical looking for those who aren't watching YouTube. We look identical. I'm in a little better shape than Nathan, you know, because I trade for MMA. You know, he's got a little bit of, you know, flab on him still, but yeah, whatever. I'm not, I'm not, you know, judging. It's okay. So. <laughs> All right. Nathan, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of our listeners today for, uh, for listening to this episode. Uh, it's been fun. So thank you, Nathan. Thank you. Thank you both. And I uh, really appreciate you uh, having me on and the opportunity. And uh, you guys keep doing what you're doing. The Bigger Pockets is an amazing place, amazing community. Uh, it changes people's lives all the time. And so I love what you guys are doing. Thanks, Thank man. You. It was a blast. Thank this, is, right. uh, this is David Green for Nathan the Bridge Brooks and Brandon Reed Half a Book Turner. Signing off. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online.